But we are in Joshua chapter 24 today, and we'll be in verse 15. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we give honor to the reading of God's Word this morning. And we're in Joshua 24, and this is how it reads in verse 15. It says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and what it means to us. And Father, we give honor this morning to the reading of your word because it is so important. It is so uh, life-changing, Father, that we uh, stand to give honor and respect to the reading of your word. Father, I pray that as we uh, look today at the, the life of Joshua and see uh, the wisdom of the years that you gave him and the wisdom that we can take from those years that you gave to him and the wisdom he had, Father, I pray that our lives would be changed. I pray that our families' lives would be changed. I pray that our community and our world would be changed. Father, I pray this morning that you would hide me behind your cross, and Father, that the words that are shared this morning come from you, and that they would impact our hearts and our minds, and Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and our lives. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As I mentioned, today is Senior Adult Sunday. <laughs> And with that being the case, I could stand here this morning and share with you a, a couple of jokes or a couple of phrases that, uh, that poke fun at uh, growing older. Or I could share with you how during my time at our last church, I served as the senior adult pastor and gained a whole lot of wisdom about what it means to grow uh, older. I could share things like they shared with me about how everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. I uh, see a few heads nodding, and people are like, I know what you mean. Uh, so uh, I learned, a lot, at times, I learned a whole lot more than I wanted to on those trips with my senior adults. But nevertheless, uh, there is a lot of wisdom in, uh, in our seniors, and we're grateful for that. But rather than starting off with something like that today, I wanted to start off talking about resumes. Now, I realize that our senior adults are not really concerned because most of them are uh, retired, uh, but most are not concerned about what would go on a resume, but I want you to follow me and you'll understand where I'm going this morning. Uh, but I do want to share with you a couple of funny things that people have put on resumes over the years as they try to get a job. Okay, and the first one is about uh, where someone was writing in the section about references. One person put, none of my references really like me, so please don't believe what they say. I think I would say no right then if I was looking over that resume, but nevertheless. Uh, when asked about any special skills, one person said that they were able to say the alphabet backwards in under five seconds. I don't know what job that would help with, but this was their special skill. Another candidate was trying to explain an arrest on his record by saying, we stole a pig, but it was a small pig, as if that mattered. But one applicant for a nursing position said, as they were applying, said that they didn't like dealing with blood or needles. Now you tell me how you can be a nurse and not deal with blood or needles. Another one said that while in the section that was marked why they were interested in the position, the person put, to keep my parole officer from putting me back in jail. And then finally, uh, another one talking about references uh, included a letter from his mother. And so uh, I don't know how much you know about job interviews, but that's probably not the best way to get a job because, you know, hopefully our mothers uh, see the good in us and try to help us out there. But when we think about resumes, all joking aside, when we think about resumes, we think about them for one of two reasons. One is people will have a resume together with a list of skills and abilities and their work experience in the hopes of landing a job. That, that's their hope with that resume, is that that will help them get a job. The other reason that we think about resumes, or even consider them a lot of times, is as a list of accomplishments to recognize somebody for an award. 
You know, a lot of times when somebody is awarded with something, you'll hear people recite they were the chairman of this board or they did this in their life and, and eventually they'll receive an award for all of their accomplishments. Well, today we plan uh, to start off by looking at the resume of a man who lived to be 110 years old. And this man would be a prime candidate for a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Jewish people uh, just because of what he accomplished. And the reason we are considering the resume of this man is so that we better understand the wisdom that came from him in his later years. Because if we look at someone's resume, if we look at someone's life and their body of work, and we see what they have done over the course of their life, how God has interacted with them over the course of a lifetime, we can then see, okay, can I trust what this man is saying, man or woman is saying, or should I just sort of discount it because they don't have anything to back it up with? This morning, we're talking about a man that is none other than the second leader of the nation of Israel after the Exodus. This man uh, goes by the name of Joshua, the son of Nun. And we see him uh, throughout the pages of the book of Joshua and some of the writings of Moses. But Joshua, personally for me, is one of my favorite uh, persons to read about in the Bible. And the reason being is because of the life that he lived, because of the example that he set, and because of all the things he did and the way God worked through his life. And this morning as we start, I want you to think about Joshua's resume. I want you to think about as we go through this, all the things he did and how we can trust what he tells us because of his experiences. You know, he was born, Joshua was born into slavery 3,500 years ago in Egypt. For the first almost one half of his life, the first half of his life, he spent it as a Hebrew slave building monuments in Egypt with the rest of the slaves. And so about halfway through his life, this guy Moses shows up on the scene and takes all the Israelites out of Egypt. They go through the, uh, the Red Sea on dry ground and they head for the promised land. And after about two months into their trip, the Israelites end up being faced with their first big challenge. Another people group called the Amalekites came out to attack them. They were going to defeat them and plunder them and take all of their stuff, basically, from the, ones they, uh, from the ones they killed. But what Moses did was he took his assistant, Joshua, and told him, said, I'm going to have you be the one responsible for gathering the Israelite army, and you're responsible for leading them. And so Joshua does that, and they go and they defeat the Amalekites. But this is an awesome story uh, about their defeat because what happens is Moses goes up onto a mountainside to watch Joshua and the Israelites fight. And while he's there, he has his staff. And as long as he held his staff in the air, the Israelites were victorious. But when he got tired and started to bring the staff down, the Israelites started to be defeated. So the two assistants, the two people that were there with him, uh, helped to hold up his arms until Joshua and the Israelites defeated the Amalekites. And this was the first of many, many victories under the leadership of Joshua for the Israelite army. But see, Joshua, a month later, followed Moses as his assistant, as his only assistant, up onto the side of Mount Sinai. And Mo, uh, Joshua stopped at one particular place and Moses went just a little further up the mountain. And while he was up the mountain just a little bit further, Moses received the law from God. He received the Ten Commandments. He received all of the law. And God inscribed it with his very own finger on two stone tablets and gave them to Moses. And so Moses comes back down. He gets Joshua. They get their stuff and they go down the mountain. And Joshua not only was probably within earshot as God gave Moses the law, Moses was standing there watching as Moses. Joshua was standing there watching as Moses took those two stone tablets and destroyed them because at the base of the mountain, he's watching the Israelites worship a false god, a golden calf. And so Joshua is experiencing all of this. He's getting to watch and see all of this. Shortly after that, we see that Joshua was one of the 12 spies for the nation of Israel sent in to check out the promised land. Joshua goes in with these other 11 guys and they go to check out the the place, and they come back, and they, they give their report, and Joshua and a man named Caleb said, look, we can go take the land. 
God has promised it to us. All we got to do is go and handle business. We go do our thing and God will hand them over to us. But the other 10 frightened the entire nation of Israel by telling them we look like grasshoppers compared to the giants in the land. Their cities had huge fortified walls. We'll never be able to take the country. Well, what ends up happening is the 10 swayed the entire nation of Israel. And because of that, because they didn't follow God and because they weren't obedient to God, God sent them into the wilderness for 40 years. The only two people over the age of 20, when they entered the uh, promised land, that had been alive at the time of the spying out of the land were Joshua and Caleb. Everyone over the age of 20 died out in the wilderness until a new generation had been raised up. But see, after the 40 years in the wilderness, God chose Moses, or chose Moses' successor to be Joshua. And so on the cusp of leading the Israelites into the promised land, Moses dies, Joshua takes over as the leader, and Joshua leads the Israelites into the promised land through a miraculous crossing of the Jordan River. They come up to the Jordan River and God instructed Joshua and Joshua instructed the, the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant, the golden ark, down into the water and said that when you get into the water, the waters will stop flowing and the entire nation can cross the Jordan River. Here's the catch. The Jordan River was at flood stage because of the ice melt in the mountains north of there. So the, the Jordan River is out of its banks, and it is, it is suicidal to walk down into the water at that point. And so what do the priests do? They take the Ark of the Covenant, they walk down into the water, and the waters stop. It's as if God had stuck his hand in the water, and the waters back up to the north and to the south. They dried up, and the Israelites walked across the Jordan River into the Promised Land on dry ground, just like they crossed the Red Sea. And so as all of this happens... You know, Joshua is just probably days away from being installed as the leader of the Israelite uh, nation. And God said some special things to Joshua when he first took over, before he even stepped foot in the promised land. And see, some of his first words are words that we take comfort in today. Because he says in Joshua 1.9 that God told him, Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God told Joshua this so that when it came time to step into those flood waters, when it, took, or when it came time to go into the promised land and conquer the Canaanite people, he knew that God would be with him. And these words had to resonate with him. They had to mean something special to him because of what he had witnessed in his past, but also every day going forward from there with every new challenge that God laid out in front of him. Joshua had to have these words ringing in his ear to help him as they conquered the promised land. You know, after those two to three million Israelites walked across the dry ground in the what was the Jordan River, we see that they set their eyes on their first city that they had to defeat, and that was the city of Jericho. And so God gave instructions to Joshua once again, and Joshua gave his instructions to the people of Israel. And what the instructions were was for the people of Israel, the army and the priests, and the priests were to take the Ark of the Covenant, the head of the army. They were to walk around the city of Jericho one time each day for six days. And after that, what would happen is, on the seventh day, they were to walk around the city seven times, blow the trumpets or the ram's horns that they had, and at that time, the city walls would come falling down. And that's exactly what happened. And as soon as God brought the walls of Jericho down, the Israelites rushed in and destroyed the city of Jericho. Pretty impressive for their first victory. It struck fear into the people of, of Canaan. And so they go to their second city, a city named Ai. And as they go to this city to defeat them, they get routed. The only loss that Jer Joshua faced as the military leader for the nation of Israel. He gets, they're defeated and they can't, they don't really know why. And Joshua goes to God and says, why did we lose? And, jo and God informs him of sin amongst the army. And it was a man named Achan who had taken things from Jericho when he wasn't supposed to. And once they dealt with Achan and his sin, what ended up happening? They go back to Ai and they completely destroyed the city. 
And from there on, they conquered the rest of the Canaanite people. See, one victory after another led to uh, different victories. They defeated people in the north and in the south. And there was even one case where they were running out of daylight. Anybody ever had that happen to you? Just didn't have enough daylight to get the job done. This week's been haymaking season for a lot of people. And just, sometimes there just ain't enough sunlight, daylight, to get it all done. Well, Joshua did something that I, I might try the next time I'm on the tractor and I'm running out of daylight. Joshua told God, he said, he said basically, we need more time. He said, he asked God to make the sun stand still. And so what did God do? God held the sun in place long enough for Joshua and the Israelites to defeat the Amorites. And that's just another example of another victory that God brought to them in a miraculous way, that it was God doing it through the people. And for the next five or six years, Joshua led the Israelites as a political, military, and spiritual leader. He, he did a lot for the people. And when the major battles, defeating the major people groups and the major kingdoms inside the promised land were done, Joshua handed over the responsibility of, of defeating the, the smaller villages and the smaller people groups to individual tribes. Judah was responsible for defeating the Canaanites inside their borders. Simeon's tribe was responsible the same, and Benjamin, and so on, and so forth. Now, when we look at this impressive resume, and we really take into account what Joshua did uh, for the people of Israel, and we see how passionate he was about following God, and serving God, and being obedient to God's commands, then we find a man that who, who would have been full of, of plenty of wisdom in his older years. We would have seen a man that we could take stock of what he said and know that he's speaking the truth because of what he had experienced. We're talking about a man who saw God part the Red Seas and walked across on dry ground. The man within earshot of God giving Moses the Ten Commandments. The man who saw God faithfully deliver enemy after enemy after enemy after enemy into the hands of the Israelite army. Why couldn't we trust what he said? Why couldn't we trust this wisdom from him? And when we consider all that he witnessed and we consider all that he experienced in his life, we have no choice. There is no good option other than to listen very carefully to what wisdom he shares with us. See, not long before Joshua died at the age of 110, Joshua called all of the people together at Shechem, where, uh, where he lived. And so as the leader of the nation, everybody came together to hear what he had to say. Sort of like a State of the Union address, if you wanted to uh, compare it to our modern government. And when he addressed them, he gave them one choice that we read about in today's text a little earlier. He gave them the choice between deciding whether they were going to serve God or serve the false idols, the false gods of the land. Joshua laid out for them their two options. For us to make a choice, there has to be options. You, have, you either have two options or multiple options, but he gave them two. He mentioned the false gods that their ancestors had been worshiping years and years before, and some of those same gods were gods that some of them were even worshiping right then. In verse 14, we didn't read it, but back in verse 14, Joshua mentions how some of their family members, some of their ancestors, had worshipped the gods in Egypt that the Egyptians worshipped. Like Ra, the sun god, and others, the, the Israelites had picked up on it, and some of them worshipped them when they were in Egypt, and some of them worshipped them in the promised land. But then Joshua goes on here in verse 15 and mentions the Babylonian gods that Abraham and his family had worshipped before Abraham was called and set apart by God. They were worshipping the Babylonian gods in Ur of Chaldea before they came across the Euphrates River and came into the promised land uh, when Abraham was alive. And then Joshua even mentioned to them here in today's text about the Canaanite gods that the Canaanites were trying to lead the Israelites into worshiping. Like the, like the fire god Molech, who the Canaanites sacrificed their children in burnt offerings to that god. And so here the Israelites are starting to fall for the false gods that some had worshipped for generations and new ones that they had just come across. 
that Joshua told the Israelites in verse 15, he told them, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Basically what Joshua did was he drew a line in the sand and he said, you have to choose which side of that line you're going to be on. Which side are you going to decide to be on? Are you going to choose right then and right there who you're going to serve? That's what he told them to do. Either serve God or serve the countless false gods made out of stone and wood and metal. That was Joshua's ultimatum. He drew the line in the sand and said, pick, make your choice, but you have to do it. His point was that we couldn't choose or that the people couldn't choose to serve God and continue to worship the false gods that their families may have been worshiping for generations. That wasn't, that wasn't going to fly, as we would say. It's not going to work. And why is that? Because God does not play second fiddle to any other God. God doesn't, he doesn't play games. He, it's either him or it's nothing, so to speak, when it comes to worship. He wants them, he want, he, Joshua wanted them to understand that they needed to make a wise decision here and choose God rather than those false gods. At the end of verse 15, though, as we looked at uh, earlier, we see that Joshua makes a bold statement. He makes a very bold stand for his faith in God. And this is a, uh, a statement that many of you are familiar with. Many of you may be like me and Misty and have uh, this verse or this part of the verse uh, up in your home to remind you. But Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua made this bold, bold statement based on the fact that he had lived a long life of devotion to God and a life where he daily witnessed the promise that God had made to him back in Joshua 1.9 being fulfilled every day. Do you remember that promise where he says, do, or have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua took that to heart and he saw it fulfilled daily in his life. And so he could very easily stand before the entire nation of Israel and tell them that statement that you see on the screen. But as for me and my house, we will, not we might, not we will if it's convenient or we will if we have time, we will serve the Lord. Joshua could stand there and make that statement very boldly. You see, the language with which Joshua spoke in the Hebrew, when he talks about the choice he and his family were making to serve the Lord, that language that he uses gives us one final insight into what he really meant when he said that. It gives us added wisdom when we fully understand what he meant in that statement and in the, in the language that he used. Because the way that Joshua was speaking, he meant it two ways. He meant it once as a once and for all decision. Yes, I've made the decision. I'm going to serve the Lord and my family's going to serve the Lord. That once and for all decision. But the other way that he meant it was that he meant it in a way of a continuous decision, a continual decision to serve God, as in the past, the present, and the future. It's as if Joshua was saying to them, I have chosen, I do choose, and I will continue to choose to serve God. Me and my family will continue to do that. Joshua had made up his mind that he was going to daily, not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, not just when it's convenient or when people are looking. He made the decision that he was going to serve God every day of his life because he had done it so many years of his entire life. See, Joshua could boldly claim his choice based on a lifetime of experience, watching God fulfill his promises, watching God deliver enemy after enemy, watching God do things that no one else could have done through the nation of Israel. Joshua made that decision based on a lifetime of experience with God. See, when you look around this sanctuary today, you can see many senior adults who have lived a life similar to that of Joshua. No, 
most have not ever fought for their country or their nation. Some have, and we're very grateful for those that have. But most have not done that like Joshua had. Uh, but many have lived long lives of faith. Many have lived a life of faith, lives where they've witnessed heartache and defeat, lives where they've witnessed joys and victories, and lives where they've witnessed God fulfill in their life the same promise that God made to Joshua when he put him in charge of the nation of Israel. That same promise that he would always be with them. The ones in our congregation, they've seen that in their life. And if you took time today to sit down and talk with some of our senior adults about what they think about Joshua's choice or his ultimatum that he gave to the people of Israel, you would find that many of them would give you the same response that Joshua gave to Israel. They would encourage, like Joshua did, he, they would encourage you to serve God and throw away those false idols, to throw away those false gods of this world that draw you away from God. They would tell you how they and their family have chosen to serve God throughout all their days. They would tell you how they chose in the past, how they chose in the, choose in the present, and how they will choose in the future as long as God puts breath in their body to serve God. They would be a great beacon of hope and encouragement with their steadfast devotion to God. But the question remains, how would you respond to that ultimatum? How would you respond when that line is drawn in the sand, when, when their encouragement is to choose between God or all of the false gods that are out there? Would you respond like the Israelites did when Joshua gave this very rousing speech capped off by the verse that we read today? When Joshua demanded a decision from the Israelites, they gave him an answer. And they gave him a very similar answer in three verses as Joshua continued to press them for a decision on whether they would serve God or not. Here's what those answers were. They said, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. We will serve the Lord. And then they said, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. Three times Joshua pressed them to figure out which side of the line they were going to be on. And he pressed them for a decision. But the only problem with the answers that they gave is that they were basically lip service. They basically said what Joshua wanted to hear and they told him those words. Because see, in, in what they said, there was no continual action. There was nothing following what they said because this is what it says at the end of the book of Joshua in verse 31. It says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. So basically when Joshua died and the older group, the senior adults, the senior citizens in the nation of Israel, when they died off and Joshua died off and were gathered to God, what happened? They didn't follow the Lord anymore. If you flip, you know, I'm not going to ask you to, but if you flip two chapters over to the second chapter of Judges, verse 10 tells us about the generation that followed those senior adults in the nation of Israel. Because what it says is that after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Don't sound too positive for the people of Israel. Why did they need the judges? Because the people of Israel fell away from God. They didn't serve him. They didn't continue to follow him as they should. When it comes to the generation of senior adults that we have with us today, they have answered and made their choice about this decision that's placed before us in the scripture of Joshua 24, 15. They've lived it out through their life. They've shown that they have chosen in the past, they choose in the present, and they will choose into the future to serve God. For the generations coming after them, though, you have to make the choice. You have to make your choice. You have to decide which side of the line are you going to be on. Are you going to serve God? Are you willing to make a lifetime commitment to serving God by throwing away those false gods, those false idols that are pulling you away from God? Or are you content with living a life that leads your children and your grandchildren 
to grow up in a world where they don't know the Lord and don't know what He's even done for you. The choice is up to each one of us. We have to make that decision. And the choice is up to you. What will you decide? Will you choose to serve God, you and your family? Or will you choose the gods of this world and let generations grow up behind you that don't know the Lord? The choice is up to us. The choice is up to each one of us. And this morning, I encourage you, like Joshua does in this scripture that we looked at this morning, to choose to serve God. This morning, I invite you during our invitation time to to do something that makes a bold statement, as bold a statement as Joshua did when he gathered the nation together at Shechem. What I encourage you to do this morning is I encourage you to bring your family to the altar during this time of uh, response, during this time of invitation. And I encourage you to kind of pray over your family that you guys will, that the ones in your family will continue to make that decision and make the right decision. And they'll make the right choice to follow God and to serve Him. And so this morning, that's my encouragement to you is to pray over your family at the altar and to make the choice to serve God and to serve Him faithfully from this day forward, just like Joshua encouraged us to do. And so this morning, as we do, I want you to stand with me. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and give you an opportunity uh, to respond during our invitational song. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer before we give you a chance to respond. Father, we come to you at this time knowing, God, that Joshua puts a very bold choice. He, he draws a line in the sand for us. He gives us an ultimatum here. And Father, we have to decide for us and for our family whether we're going to serve you or whether we're going to let the false gods of this world cause generations to grow up behind us that don't know you, that don't know what you've done for those generations ahead of you. Father, I pray that, that we would make a bold stand in this, and then, as Joshua did, make a daily decision, a daily choice to serve you, a daily decision to stand by that decision and let you work through their lives. Father, I pray that as you've spoken to us today, that, Father, we would respond however you're leading us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.